Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. We have about nine people on the webinar. Um, so first off, welcome to our information session about the 2023 Intersectional Qualitative Research Methods Institute for Advanced Doctoral Students. We refer to it as the Institute for the remainder of the, of the webinar. The Institute is sponsored by the University of Texas at Austin, uh, Latino Research Institute, and the University of Maryland at College Park Consortium for Race, Gender, and Ethnicity. My name is Dr. Daisy Morales Campos. I'm the Area Director for Training Programs and a Research Assistant Professor at the Latino Research Institute. I have the honor of being the moderator for today's session. First, I'll provide uh, information on using the Q&A function in the Zoom webinar for today's session, and then I'll cover the agenda. I have to click. Okay, maybe not. Okay. So at the bottom of your screen, you'll see these functions. If you would like to ask a question, we ask that you use the, the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and you can submit a question at any time. We'll answer the questions at the end of the session, so feel free to post your questions using the Q&A function at any time during the session. So this is the agenda for today. I'll first uh, introduce our presenters today. Um, we'll cover what the Institute is about. What does uh, coming to the Institute, what is the experience like? Um, who should apply? We'll go over the specific details about the application process. And at the end, we'll have the question and answer session. So we have three presenters today. Our first presenter is Dr. Deborah Paramedina. She's the inaugural director of the Latino Research Institute. She holds an appointment as a professor in the Department of Mexican American and Latino Latina Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, Dr. Paramedina is a health disparities researcher and has extensive experience in developing culturally competent public health uh, chronic disease and healthy lifestyle interventions with underserved, underserved communities. She uses uh, mixed methods, community-based participatory approach, often designing and implementing interventions that utilize a promotora model and involve multimedia text messaging and other technological communications. Our second presenter today is Dr. Gonzalez Martin. She's a folklorist and associate professor of Mexican-American Latino Latina studies. Uh, she's an active affiliate faculty member of the Center for Mexican American Studies, Women Gender Studies, and the Latino Media and Arts Program at the University of Texas. She holds a PhD in folklore and ethnomusicology from Indiana University. She's also the editor of the journal Western Folklore and on several other editorial boards. Our last presenter is Dr. Ruben Para Cardona. He's an associate professor at the Steve Hicks School for Social Work, where he also serves um, as a coordinator for the school's initiatives in Latin America. Uh, for the Latino Research Institute, Dr. Para Cardona also serves as the area director of research. Um, he's received funding from NI NIMH to investigate the treatment of efficacy and relevance of two versions of an evidence-based parenting intervention, culturally adapted Latino families and young children. He also has a night of funding and has a wealth of experience on research collaborations across the US and Mexico border. And now I will pass um, the mic to Dr. Bara Medina, who will go ahead and introduce the Institute. Uh, thanks, Dr. Morales Campos. And uh, thanks everyone for taking time to join us today on this um, informational session and for your interest in our Intersectional Qualitative Research Methods Institute for advanced doctoral stu um, students. Uh, this institute provides a unique training opportunity that's designed specifically for advanced doctoral students. Uh, there are a few training institutes in the United States that focus on qualitative research methods and 
none that we are aware of incorporate uh, discussions regarding intersectionality, uh, the intersections of race, class, gender, ethnicity, and other dimensions of inequity. Uh, in addition to facilitating important conversations about research and intersectionality, this institute also provides uh, practical lessons in professional development to intersectional scholars in pursuit of uh, successful academic and research careers. If you are uh, have joined today's session and you are already a postdoctoral researcher or a university faculty, you could, um, there's a separate institute that is offered by the University of Maryland College Park Consortium for Race, Gender, and Ethnicity that is designed specifically for postdoctoral researchers and early career faculty. So if <clears throat> today's session is on the Advanced Doctoral Student Institute, and so for more information on the one for early career faculty, you can visit our website and there is um, information that will direct you to um, where to get information on the, um, the Institute for uh, Early Career Faculty. This uh, institute is now in its sixth year. And the goals of this um, institute are to really work with uh, advanced doctoral students to develop uh, critical race and intersectional perspectives for designing and interpreting uh, their research. You know, we see intersectionality as both a theoretical framework as well as a research strategy. And this um, approach begins with the experience or centers the experiences of marginalized groups and also examines interconnected structures of power that affect individual and group identities and the choices they have in their lives. And the approach also promotes social justice and social change by linking research and practice. The Institute is designed to enhance qualitative research data analysis skills, holistic interpretation, as well as uh, some analytic writing. We will um, provide guidance on getting to the finish line, uh, how to complete your doctoral degree successfully, and what strategies uh, you need in order to transition successfully to the next phase of your career as a postdoc. And now I'm going to um, tell you a little bit about what, uh, when and where the Institute will take place. Next slide, thanks. So the Institute is a one week summer Institute. It's scheduled to begin on Sunday, June 25th with um, a welcome dinner on uh, with a welcome dinner. And then it ends on Friday, June 30th. Uh, the Institute will be hosted on campus uh, of the University of Texas at Austin. You can see an image there of our campus and the tower. So the welcome dinner is on Sunday and then the actual sessions begin on Monday. Uh, the Institute will be hosted on our campus, the University of Texas at Austin, which is the flagship school for the University of Texas system that has six academic campuses and uh, no, nine academic campuses and six health science center uh, campuses statewide. And it's ranked uh, among the biggest and best universities in the country. UT Austin is also a Hispanic serving institution and is home for over 50,000 students and 3,000 teaching faculty. Amid uh, the background of UT Austin, you know, we are in Austin, the city, which is uh, the capital of Texas, and the city itself is recognized for um, the diverse entertainment and culture that we have here. Uh, if you're a foodie or like music, there's lots of things to explore. We have great outdoor settings as well. 
And so it has a lot to offer people from a variety of interests um, and it doesn't snow very often <laughs> and definitely not in the summer. So <laughs> uh, we'll always have pretty good weather here too. So I'm going to go ahead now and uh, hand it over to Dr. Gonzalez Martin, who's going to tell us a little bit about what to expect uh, from the Institute experience. Hey folks, um, welcome to the webinar. I'm going to share a little bit about sort of the experience, what we've seen and what we hope you'll experience um, if you choose to come to the um, Institute in the coming summer. So as, as Dr. Bara Medina said, you know, we run for about five, five and a half days total. Um, this isn't just about um, methods training or even sort of narrowing readings around theoretic uh, theory and methodology. This is really a collaborative experience where we want students to come together and build networks of support for sort of this shared approach to research, but also a shared politic towards um, academic work in general. So you'll notice that we build in both um, pre-institute uh, pre resources and post-institute check-ins, right? You'll get a chance to meet small groups, um, connect with your potential um, research mentor, and then um, we care about how you're doing. And so the idea is that you're gonna be using this experience to bridge into your work where you are now, but also hopefully to bring your work um, advance your work in some way that you're hoping to do, but also that you're not doing that in isolation, right? So we're thinking about you building social connections with peers, with mentors who are core faculty for those who are sharing their knowledge in other um, one-off sessions during the week, but also potentially um, folks that you, you know of or want to connect through um, connect to at UT Austin itself. So think about that as you're 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 connecting with planning um, to come and applying. Uh, the idea that are there people on campus you'd like to connect with? We want that to be part of your experience. Um, one way in which folks have described um, the Institute beyond enriching is also intensive and exhausting. Um, we do manage to keep your time fairly busy throughout the day. But as we've been listening back and forth to what students want and students need, we have carved out more time midday to give people a chance to sort of um, socialize more organically or reach out beyond um, the confines of the mentor peer relationships of the Institute itself. So people can explore campus resources a little bit more. Um, but next slide, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what, what the Institute um, and the what the, what the institute is and isn't. So Daisy, if you could go to the next slide. So one of the big questions we get asked is, oh, you're gonna help me write the dissertation. Is this a writing retreat? The answer is no, <laughs> this is not a writing retreat, but this is um, a week long of intensive seminars and connections with peers and mentors that will absolutely help develop your ideas with writing and help establish some writing practices or even trading tips and tricks with folks who might be in similar um, positions and in, in their um in their timeline, right? You might be writing at the same point someone else is writing um, or trying to get into your writing. And so um, you might also be dealing with similar issues. So the idea of your writing being intensive and personal and maybe a little bit traumatizing as you work through it, you'll have a room full of peers that might be able to talk with you about that. And obviously your mentors will also have insights to share. So while this isn't a writing retreat, we do contribute to your writing. You will have this year um, time sort of set aside in our shared spaces to write. And so it's not required, but we encourage you to set up these good practices that you can test out with us here in the Institute. It isn't something that we check on. It isn't something that, uh, you know, we enforce, but we want to offer you the opportunity to turn these long days, right, into these intensive spaces. And maybe you can decide what works for you and what you can bring home with you. So writing um, sessions early in the morning before you have one-on-one -on -one, um, meetings with a, men a small mentoring group, but also there's possibly independent um, independent evening writing sessions where we, ha we have a space for you to work in if you wanna work with your peers, right? And again, there's so many um, available resources on campus that are open 24 hours or late night. You can find ways in which to write, but again, it's on your own time. It's not necessarily built into the days beyond the morning sessions. All right, next slide, please. 
So what does your day look like? So we break down the day into what I like to think of as manageable pieces, right? So you start your day possibly with a writing session on your own, but maybe in a shared space. And then you're broken up into a small um, writing discussion group, right? where you can start discussing uh, your progress, your, your thoughts, your project in general, your thoughts on intersectionality um, with a, a faculty mentor, a core faculty mentor, and a group of peers who we've organized um, before we organize in advance to get you to have some common ground with the folks that you're sharing time with in the morning so you can think through issues together. Um, that is every day that is followed by morning um, sessions about intersectionality, theoretical approaches, methodological approaches, again, very practically oriented um, materials. We do not claim to teach you intersectionality from beginning to end in extensive detail. This isn't a graduate seminar, but this is a place for you to pick up on ideas and pick up on some resources that might take you into greater depth in your own work on your own time. But we try to introduce you to all the pieces um, that lead these breadcrumbs that might lead to what might be considered a bigger meal for your um, dissertation and your um, publication um, work. These morning sessions, which are, again, more theoretically and methodologically focused, are followed by an hour and a half lunch, again, where you, you can commiserate with one another. Um, you can have one-on-one -on -one meetings with um, core faculty. You can make time to meet with people outside of the institute who are on campus or in the greater Austin area who you might want to collaborate with. After that time, we come back together and we have these late afternoon evening sessions. Um, there's two kind of different kinds. They're really professional development oriented. So these sessions will be on biographical statements, thinking about um, thinking about uh, applying for uh, funding or applying for postdoctoral um, experiences, applying and thinking about publication, right? Slightly different form of thinking than necessarily what gets applied in your, your research itself, but thinking, what do I do with that, right? Where are you taking this work? And so we're trying to holistically bring together your larger experiences as advanced graduate students who are looking to transition into research um, and faculty positions. Now, keep in mind, people do come to us who do not have those experiences. And so they feel like, oh, I'm spending all my time thinking about academia. Well, that is our focus, right? So if you're sort of on the fence with where you want to go next, just keep in mind that research and faculty positions um, is our primary training focus. Next slide, please. So we offer a variety of thematic areas that are connected to um, our core faculty, but you'll be having sessions um, with a variety of different faculty members that also have other um, other research area and specialization. So if you look at the little chart right here, um, we look at areas of education and economic and social um, uh, opportunities, right? Particularly focusing on, on working class families. We're thinking about social health, public health, mental health, and thinking about the disparities between um, group experiences. But we're also thinking about cultural arts and practice, right? What does it mean to connect in with people in place? Um, and how does that help us think through intersectional frameworks of oppression? Um, we newly added this um, for this coming session, um, a core faculty member who works um, with afro Latino you know, um, politics and policy and thinking about group consciousness. So we're really developing these areas um, and we find people fit in quite well into these different categories in terms of getting mentorship, but also taking their research um, to maybe a next level that they haven't quite imagined. So these are the areas that we focus on most, remembering that you have access to core faculty, you have access to um, our speakers who you might be able to connect with during a session, but you also have the ability to connect one-on-one -on -one with other faculty uh, members on the UT campus, right? So again, for our core faculty, we're thinking about the areas and disciplines of education political science, sociology, public health, women and gender studies, anthropology and folklore, cultural studies, um, just to say um, a few of the areas where we do and do not intersect. We are talking about qualitative research and specializations, right? That doesn't mean that people don't do quantitative work, but our focus is on qualitative analysis and interventions. And so we're thinking about um, interviewing processes, ethnography, media analysis, um, intervention studies, population studies. These are all areas um, that we can speak to as um, faculty members. Um, 
So really, when we think about the thematic areas, we're really thinking about intersectionality as a politic that you as a scholar and that we as scholars bring to the academy or to research spaces more generally, right? But if this is your interest, we encourage you to use part of your time at the Institute to cultivate one-on-one -on -one relationships and really get a handle and think through um, what you're doing um, with intersectionality and how do you want to make it work and transform um, your work through it. So now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Parra Cardona to talk about eligibility requirements and the application process. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Rachel Gonzalez Martin, for such a thorough uh, and, and lively presentation of, of the training. Uh, great job with that. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ruben Parra Cardona, and I'm an associate professor in the Steve Hicks School of Social Work, as well as area director of research at the Latino. Uh, Research Institute. So I will talk uh, briefly with you about eligibility criteria for the Institute. That is, what are the characteristics we expect to find in applicants? And having this clarity, we have confirmed year after year is essential, as some of you may need to wait until the next cycle to apply. But at, and at the same time, the eligibility criteria is so essential because um, all institute participants have to achieve a minimal set of academic goals to ensure satisfaction with the institute experience. We want you to be satisfied, to be excited, and we have to make sure that that eligibility criteria is met to, to achieve that goal. And we also to, uh, uh, want you to experience walking out of this experience as a highly productive experience. So that's the rationale for our criteria. We have uh, four basic requirements. First, all the applicants must be doctoral students who have advanced to candidacy within the last three years. That means that candidacy is understood as a successful defense of your dissertation proposal by the time you submit your application to the Institute. We have confirmed over and over that this requirement is essential as it is important for all of you in, and for all the participants to be exposed to similar experiences in the academic trajectory. Also, all applicants must have complete clarity about objectives and goals of their dissertation study. The time is very limited in the Institute. So that clarity is essential for you to feel satisfied and for you to feel productive. Second, applicants must have collected data on an intersectional quality research uh, project. The criteria of intersectionality is broadly defined. We know that you come from many backgrounds, mentoring experience, et cetera. And uh, we understand intersectionality as a studies addressing two or more areas of diversity, whatever this may be, maybe gender, socioeconomic status, ethnicity, disability. Third, applicants must be currently enrolled in an academic program at a US academic institution. And scholars who are, um, are Mexican-American, African-American, Native American, Puerto Rican, or from other socially and economically disadvantaged groups are encouraged to apply. We purposefully identify these groups as these populations of scholars continue to be significantly underrepresented in academic institutions. Next slide, please. Now, with regards to what you have to prepare prior to starting the application. First, be prepared to upload the following documents in PDF format. Please make sure that each file name starts with your last name for easy identification. The, re the required documents are your curriculum, Vita, a letter of support, an official letterhead from this your dis dissertation chair. This letter is very important because it should confirm that your data, data will be ready for analysis and interpretation prior to the arrival to the Institute. Then a brief biographical statement. It's brief, 150 words or less, but this is a very important document because this is your opportunity to share briefly with us highlights of your professional background, whatever is meaningful to you and goes in line with the Institute. And this is also your opportunity to share with you, with us your motivations for choosing your program of research. And finally, uh, a description of your dissertation research project, 500 words or less. A clear and succinct reference to intersectionality 
and the way it is addressed in your dissertation research must be included in your description. This is very important. Sometimes folks overlook addressing this. And uh, for us, it's very important to make sure that there's a, a very nice synergy and fit with the Institute. Now I will turn it over to Dr. Parra Medina, who will all um, talk now about application deadlines and other institute details. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Papra Cardona. So the institute, so the application is currently open and we'll be accepting applications through December 2nd of 2022. So um, got a, a few weeks left here. Uh, these are submitted online and um, our goal is to review these early um, in the spring semester or maybe winter quarter, depending where you're enrolled uh, and have decisions to you early in February. And then of course the Institute takes place from June 25th to June 30th. Um, so let me also address a couple of questions that come up uh, regularly about uh, the Institute, some logistical things. So next, is lodging provided? Daisy, can you, uh, thank you. So, so lodging is provided. We provide um, housing on campus. All the participants are housed together in a dormitory. Uh, everybody gets their private dorm space. Um, but it really is important for everybody to be co-located um, because you really build a sense of community and there's opportunities to continue the work and dialogue after uh, in the evening, after sessions, et cetera. So once uh, we make decisions about who's accepted uh, and we send out um, acceptance notices, we will provide more information about um, the details on the housing that's provided uh, for participants who register. Next, uh, so there is a cost to the Institute. It is $900 and this covers the costs of the tuition, the lodging from Sunday night through Thursday night. Most people leave on Friday evening. Uh, and then we also provide some meals. Most, mo every day you get breakfast and lunch and snacks. So throughout the day while you're um, in the Institute, uh, we don't provide dinner, but we do have two events uh, while you are here uh, where we do provide dinner. There is a Sunday night welcome dinner. And then uh, during the Institute uh, Tuesday night, we have an evening session where students can uh, ask questions to faculty kind of Anything you want to know, uh, we're going to lay it out for you, uh, no, no holds barred. And so that evening is always a lot of fun. And um, yeah, and we have a nice dinner at a, at a local uh, restaurant, which is uh, really nice. So we include then your tuition, your lodging, uh, meals, breakfast, lunch, snacks, and two dinners. If you, there's also, um, a web, on our website, we have a section that has a Q and A. So, you know, you can go there uh, to see, you know, other questions that people ask. Uh, some people do ask about financial, um, excuse me, uh, financial assistance. And we do have a limited amount of financial assistance that is available, but, um, you do have to apply for that separately, but we encourage people who want to apply not to wait <laughs> until February or March to start looking for resources. Most graduate programs have resources for professional development for students that you can apply through the graduate school, your college or academic department, uh, but those resources 
uh, are limited and they they get spent. And so you need to start thinking about that now and reach out to your advisor, department chair to see what sorts of resources you can have access to, to maybe help you offset some of the costs of the tuition. Okay, uh, let's turn it over to Dr. Morales Campos and we're going to move into Q&A. Are you... I'm here. I just I can't figure out how to show myself again. <laughs> You're there. We see you. You're there. You will see. You. Okay. I can't see myself. How strange. Okay. <laughs> well, now we're gonna go to our question and answer session. Um, I have a couple questions already in the Q and A, but if anybody has anything, please feel free to start posting now. Um, just a reminder to our panelists: um, if you want to answer the question, please unmute yourself. Um, and let me know and just state your name before answering the question. So Ruben, I actually have, or Dr. Baragalona, I have two questions that are for you. Um, one says, I will reach candidacy in February, 2023. So in three months, will I be eligible? Yes, uh, I think, um, you know, the requirement on candidacy, it's been very important for us to follow. We, it was, um, we were more lax in the beginning, but we re recognize that um, plans can change for a variety of factors, you know, uh, changes in compositions of the dissertation committee, changes in the proposed designs or in the implementation. So um, to, to make it uh, the most relevant and um, to make it the most productive, we have uh, clearly defined that by the time you apply to the institute, you have to have had a successful defense of your dissertation proposal. Uh, that does not eliminate the possibility of you having this training. As uh, Dr. Parra Medina was mentioning, there's an alternative training. I have referred some of my own students to that training who were not able to comply with this requirement. We have just seen that by experience, this is the um, a very important requirement um, to, to have. So, you know, we provide the same opportunity for all the applicants. One more, Dr. Baragardona. This is from someone else. Um, do you have to do you have to advance to candidacy prior to applying or prior to the start of the institute? For example, can you advance to candidacy in late December? Well, I think going back to um, to to the, my previous response, I, I would say we will use the criteria is by the time you click submit to that application, you must have already defended that. Uh, proposal successfully defended that. So I think it goes back to that. I and mean, it seems like a stringent requirement. What we have seen that is in the best benefit for applicants, but also for the whole group, for the group as a whole. Okay, thank you. Uh, for this next question, if you could let me know who would like to answer it. In the personal statement, do we have to mention who we want our faculty mentor to be? I can answer that. Um, no, so um, you will see on our flyer uh, or when you visit our website, there's thematic areas. So really what you should do is kind of look at those thematic areas and see potentially which one you, you kind of align with because those really um, connect to faculty expertise. Um, and it we try, it changes every year kind of based on the mix of the students, right? So we try to create, connect the students with the faculty that has the closest kind of expertise in terms of methodology, population, um, discipline, right? So there's lots of factors that kind of, um, that, that we consider when we're creating a small group of about four students who are then connected to one faculty member. And so um, it's really just important for you to define well, you know, how you're using intersectionality, you know, in your, in your dissertation project uh, so that you, we can make the best match. Thank you, Dr. Prado Medina. Um, if anyone wants to volunteer for this next question, does it have to be specifically the use of intersectionality, parentheses, Crenshaw, or can it also be focused on intersecting identities such as gender, race, sexuality, disability? 
I can answer that one. It does not have to be, um, you don't have to be citing Crenshaw <laughs> to be eligible to participate. We really want folks who are engaging and trying to en enhance their scholarly use of and connection to, again, intersect intersecting forms of oppression. Um, and so, yes, absolutely apply if you, you're considering these factors and maybe you're trying to put words um, to something that you're already doing, um, but you don't necessarily have to be, be drawing on Crenshaw and we'll be talking about that um, in the seminar itself. Okay, thank you, Dr. Gonzalez Martin. Um, the next question, whoever wants to volunteer, um, who is eligible for financial assistance? Uh, I'll do that one since I covered it in the slide. So, you know, anyone really um, who can demonstrate need. Uh, what we do ask, um, again, it's going to be a written request upon acceptance, a written request. And also we ask people to um, give us, you know, evidence that they have tried to obtain <laughs> resources from their own campus, right? It's like, we really want you to take advantage of the resources on your campus. That's why we're encouraging you to start thinking about that now um, so that you can um, access those resources. Um, so we do want to make sure that you've, you know, given a good faith effort uh, to try to get resources. And then of course, explaining uh, why there is a, a financial need. Thank you, Dr. Uh, next question. Um, what size cohort do you anticipate being accepted to the Institute? Any volunteers? Uh, uh, I'll do it. Um, so historically, our Institute has been anywhere from 12 to 18. I think last year was the smallest um, cohort that we had, um, and that was purposeful. Um, so we find that that's pretty much the sweet spot we have four core faculty. Um, and if you're interested in knowing who the core faculty are, that information is included on our website. You've met to today, Dr. Rachel Gonzalez-Martin, Dr. Ruben Parra Cardona. We also have Dr. Richard Reddick, as well as Dr. Danielle Cleland. So they're called core faculty, which means they're with us all week long. Um, and they're also um, working uh, with a, a small group of usually four students three to four students, right? So if you have four core faculty and three to four students, you end up with about 12 to 16 uh, participants. And so that's a, you know, a nice group, I think, uh, to work with throughout the week. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if Dr. Para Medina or Dr. Para Cardona could answer the question that's posted right now in the QA. It's a, a very long question, but I think it's very important. So I don't know if either one of you could read it and then respond to it live. It has to do with candidacy. I know candidacy is a is a big challenge because it's yeah. so it varies in different programs, right? So mm -hmm. You know what? Uh, what you have to do in one program to advance to candidacy could be different from what the requirements are to advance in another um, program. So what we what we call how we define advance to candidacy means that you have successfully defended your dissertation proposal, right? So that means your faculty committee and your chair have signed off on your dissertation project. So it is set in stone, you know what you're doing. And also, if you've done that by December 1st, the probability that you will have some data, qualitative data, some experiences already in trying to implement your data collection, maybe having you know, a few transcripts to start thinking about. So that's really important, right? And so, that's what we are talking about when we say advanced to candidacy. That means you have an approved dissertation proposal. And with the expectation that there will, you will have some experience with collecting some of your data and hopefully some of, you know, an interview, at least one interview or whatever it is, if it's, you know, some um, other kinds of um, artifacts, right, that, that you'll be uh, 
examining. So that's how we define it. And, and I would like just to add the importance of that. I think after uh, the initial years that we implemented the Institute, it really is in the benefit of, of, of the applicants and students, because by the time you have successfully defended the proposal, you have complete clarity and a sense of direction. The Institute pace is very fast. Uh, there's a lot of sessions. There's a, uh, the debriefing small groups. So we have seen that everybody needs already to have that sense of direction very well defined to, to maximize their experience. Otherwise, there can be frustrations or there could be even more anxiety because um, if people are still have not defended and are considering a couple of options, it may create more confusion. So I know it's a very stringent requirement, but it's, I think, one of those requirements that we have seen over and over that it's in the best benefit of students. But because even when they come with that clarity is a stressful process, is intense, but I think they having the clarity that they are in that set of direction, it's very beneficial. And don't forget that there's the other institute to which, for example, I told two, two of my mentees here in my program that they would not be eligible to apply, they would not advance to candidacy, and they uh, moved to the other institute at the University of Maryland and have benefited tremendously. So it's just, I think that the fit is essential and the timing as well. Awesome. We have another question in the chat. I mean, at the chat, the Q&A. It says, if we are accepted but complete our dissertation prior to the Institute, could we work on data analysis and writing for a different study? I would say yes. We have had a couple of students who, because this is like at the end of June, right? So we have had some students who have just recently finished and they choose to come to our institute rather than the one um, for postdoctoral researchers. And we have seen that they do benefit in particular, yes, if you're still thinking about how you're gonna expand your project, right? Or maybe you want to, um, you know, like you're saying, apply it to another area of research, but then there's also the whole professional development piece, right? So the other thing that we're focusing on is preparing you for the next stage of your research career. So, you know, so think about that too. If you're already in a postdoc, right? If you already know where you're gonna be next fall, then I don't know, maybe you won't benefit as much from our sessions related to how to find and secure a postdoc, how to write a cover letter and a biographical research statement. I mean, you know, so there's lots of sessions, you know, how to advance your publishing. Um, so if, we find that if you're a very early you know, graduate, you might still benefit from that, right? Because you still need to develop those aspects of your kind of skill set in order to transition to the next phase of your um, kind of academic or research uh, trajectory. Or, you know, there's the early career faculty one that also happens. Uh, that one occurs the first week of June. Um, every summer, the first week of June, and that's for postdoctoral researchers and early career faculty, but you would have to reach out to them directly uh, about the criteria. Can I just add that it's really important for students to go and investigate um, each of the programs that were our program and the Maryland program um, and really see and be honest with what you need. Right, because I think some students are like, oh, I really want to attend, but I'm I'm slipping in between time frames. Well, it really is about what you'll be able to get out of an institute if you're already finished a dissertation or already have a trajectory. Um, it's not something necessarily we can set the parameters, but only you know exactly kind of what you need moving forward. So I just encourage people to look at both programs to make sure that you understand what your fit might be. Thank you. And I did post um because someone asked how to get information you can email us at lri at austin.utexas.edu i'd be happy to send you the information for maryland the information is also on our website if you search for um, iqrmi slash ads ads um, it should bring up the page and the link to maryland is on the same website where we have our information so just wanted to make sure everyone was clear on that. And I had one more question on here. It's, um, can I attend the Institute if I have qualitative data, but it's not my dissertation data? Yes. 
<laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, the criteria is advanced to candidacy. We were hope that you do have your own data, right? You would benefit much more from that. Um, but like uh, Dr. Pablo Carlos said, sometimes things happen, you know, for example, COVID, right? <laughs> and people weren't able to actually uh, implement some of their data collection that they had planned. And so the ideal scenario would be for you to have um, your own data. Um, but sometimes we've had cases where participants are working with a faculty member and they're involved in a research project that, that they've been engaged with. Um, and there is some data that they can use uh, for analysis and, and they've used that to kind of begin to think about how to apply intersectionality in analysis. But of course, um, you know, the it would be best or you'd be a stronger candidate for the Institute, right? If you had your own data. Okay. Uh, it, I don't think anyone has any more questions. There's no more questions in the Q and A. Um, so we wanna thank everybody for, our, for attending the information session on the Institute. Um, this Zoom women, webinar has been recorded and we will post it on our website um, for participants that are on the webinar now to review at your leisure, or if you'd like to share it with colleagues who you think might be interested and fit the criteria, um, please refer them to us. If you do have any further questions, please check the FAQ, the Frequently Asked Question page. Um, and also you can email us at, as I said earlier, lri at austin.utexas.edu, and we'd be happy to answer any other questions that may come up after you leave the webinar. I'd like to thank our panelists, our participants. Um, this was a successful information session, and we hope to receive your applications by December 2nd. Good luck, everyone. Thank you. Good luck, everyone.